Then, of course, there are the various plants that we are using to celebrate the season. We've seen mistletoe before. It's a green plant with white berries that are very, very poisonous. The mistletoe is a very sacred plant in the occult world. It's a fertility plant. It's for this reason that the custom of when you walk under the mistletoe you're supposed to kiss, that's what's symbolizing the rites of fertility. The Christmas wreath, it is circular in its design and it was done so for a reason. And I'm going to try to be as tactful about this as possible. But if the truth be known, this first of all represents the cycle of life and the cycle of reincarnation. The reason that is so is because occultically speaking, again, this is another um, fertility symbol because it represents the female sexual organs. And it's for this reason why in the, in the occult world there is still place candles around it because it symbolizes the male phallic symbol, the unification of both of them. And of course, we've seen the holly plant before. This is again another fertility plant. It's a minor one in the occult, but this one is still used to um, celebrate the Yule season in the occult world. And of course, a lot of us honestly believe that these holidays are harmless, that there's nothing wrong with them. Well, as we continue along, how many people, if this is really a harmless holiday, could have honestly right now explain the origins of Santa Claus? Let's face it, Santa Claus, just like these holidays, just didn't fall out of heaven. They had to have come somewhere. In the occult world, remember as I stated before, the winter god is known as the stag god. Through the myth that are found in the occult world, Satan is actually trying to convince his followers that he is like God. See, God has three quali qualities that, of course, no one else has. He's omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. He sees all, he knows all, he is all powerful. This is God, just part of God. When we look at the characteristics of Santa Claus, how many of us remember Santa Claus is also omnipotent, according to the legends? Do you know he can tell you at any given time who's been bad and who's been good. And according to um, one popular story, Santa Claus learned how to pick up snow and make it into a snowball. And this snowball is actually used as a crystal ball. He actually learned to do this through the winter god. He's got the power to look through this crystal ball, use it as a scrying device, and divine who's been good and who's been bad. As far as him being everywhere, well, yes, according to the myths, he also has the ability to be like God and be omnipresent. Because according to the story, he can circumnavigate the world in hours and give everyone what they deserve. And if you look at the Scandinavian legend, especially where we get into Odin, according to the ancient myths, Odin took out one of his eye and threw it in the well of knowledge. So he himself would gain wisdom. Now, aren't these the three things that make up God? All-knowing, all-powerful, and all-present? This is exactly what Satan is telling his followers through this particular occult holiday. And mind you, why do you think they have reindeers? in this story. They symbolize the stag god. These are stag creatures, aren't they? And there's eight of them for a very specific reason. Eight in gematria stands for new beginnings. 
However, eight is the only number when you place it on its side becomes an occult symbol. And that is the symbol for infinity, the infinite yearly return of the stag god. Why do you think Rudolph you know, has a red nose? It's the traditional colors. In the celebration of Yule, in the occult world, there is always red and green. These are the two colors that are used during that time of the year. The mistletoe, holly, wreath, the pine trees, the fir trees, all of them are green. The holly berries, the bows, um, Santa's clothes, Rudolph's nose, all that is red. You people didn't create this stuff. It was already there. All that happened is that it was brought into your American calendar and it became Americanized and Christianized. That's how you get this. So the question is, whose birthday is December 25th then if it's not Jesus Christ? Semiramis and Nimrod, the two original co-founders of the occult world had a child. He was known as Tammuz. Tammuz was born on December 25th. Four days before December 25th is when the night of Yule begins. It was purposely brought to December 25th for a reason, as far as Christmas goes. It was done for a reason. Back during the early Roman Empire days when you had the first popes, of course, we know historically speaking, the first one was Constantine. He took over Rome in 313 AD and then established the Council of Trent and declared what was known as the Edict of Milan in 323 AD to where he started what he wanted now, what he called a state religion. Now, constantly, Constantine, and this is historically, you can prove this easily, was a practicing pagan. He was an occultist. He took these pagan occult rituals and holidays, put them in this new state religion, and if you would, candy-coated it with an air of Christianity. The reason he did that, because he knew the pagans would recognize this for what it really was and still come in. December 25th, as I said before, is the birthday of Tammuz. What was also going on during the Roman Empire in those days, on December 25th now, was the day of Saturnalia. To the Romans, the head of all the gods was the god known as Saturn. This festival to Saturn was marked with a couple very specific events. First of all, there would be great banquets. Second of all, people would be drinking till they could drink no longer. Third, they would be given out presents to one another. Now think about this. Don't we have our traditional Christmas banquets to this very day? Aren't we having wassail and other different types of drinks during this holiday? Aren't we exchanging presents on December 25th? All this you get because of the occult. When you think about it, what would any of this have to do with the birthday of Christ anyways? Even some of these traditions, and I do mean traditions, we've been taught tradition and not scriptures. Tradition tells us that there was three wise men that made it to the manger, correct? Scripture tells us those wise men never made it to the manger. They never made it till Christ was two years old and he was in his father's workshop. That's what the Bible tells us. Tradition tells us otherwise. Tradition also tells us, well, this is the birthday of Jesus Christ. We have to make up our minds. If we're going to go by tradition, or if we're going to go by scripture. As I stated before, this is going to strike home 
and it may hit you, some of you very hard, but the truth is, as born-again Christians, we have to remember Jeremiah chapter 10 tells us we are not supposed to learn the way of the heathens. You will find out when Joshua was bringing the children of Israel into the promised land, the reason God threw all those people and those nations out was because they were all practicing the occult religions. God named the nine reasons why they were being cast out of those nations and every single one of those reasons, you look at them, were occultic ones. This is how evil, how foul this stuff is in the eyes of God. And yet, for some reason, we honestly think that there's nothing wrong with this stuff, that if we just say, well, God, you know my heart, you know that I'm honoring you. How are we honoring God if we're doing it through occult holidays? I can't see how we honestly can say we are honoring God. If we're doing it the exact same way those people in the occult are doing it to this very day. And yet, of course, there's a lot of other holidays that we think well, let's put it to this way, that we have Christianized and we have actually fooled ourselves into believing our Christian. The next one would be Easter. This one, let's face it, this one is extremely popular. This one is supposed to be the resurrection of Jesus Christ, correct? And yet, you're going to find out Easter and the resurrection of Jesus Christ have absolutely nothing in common. Now, if you remember in Genesis, at the Tower of Babel, and this is the classic um, rendition of the Tower of Babel itself, the people there had sinned against God. They formed a one-world government under a one-world people, under a one-world language, under a one-world tongue, under a one-world religion, which was the occult. The co-founders of this occult religion was Nimrod and Semiramis. God did not want this to happen. So in order to get these people to finally break away from this and their sin, he confused their language. The people went throughout the entire world. Now think about this for a second. When these people left, do you think that they forgot anything? Do you think that they suddenly forgot their occult religion? Do you think they finally, um, that they forgot where they came from and what they did? Of course they didn't. When we take a look at the next great empire that came about after Babylon, we see something very interesting here. Now down here is a great pyramid of Giza. It's on the Giza Plateau in Egypt. But if you look at the top one, that is what's known as a step pyramid. It was one of the earliest pyramids ever built. It was built by the pharaoh Djoser. Isn't that the exact formation that they were building the Tower of Babylon with? Something very interesting is happening to us both historically and prophetically. It all started in Babylon as far as our civilization goes. A one world religion, one world people under one world language, one financial system, so on and so forth. It's going to come around, and according to the scriptures, we're going to have Babylon all over again. We're going to have this one world order under one world people, under one world occult religion. We're doomed to repeat history because we did not learn the mistakes of it. We have really gone off the mark. But as I stated before, you will notice, same formation. What is even more interesting, how many people have heard of the European common market and that they're trying to create a one world monetary system known as the European unit? 